hydrated and everything before we start this. <laughs> you go for it. We're ready. We're excited to talk uh, to you. You know, um, I, maybe Ben, I'll, I'll start with you. It, obviously, this concert's supposed to be sort of a bookend for the original 75 concerts at Dodger Stadium. Yeah. Because I'm a dinosaur, I actually went to one of those shows. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm wondering, as producers, how do you make a younger audience get a sense of what it was like back then of how big of a deal he was. I mean, Elton John's been around forever if you're 40, but maybe you don't realize how big he was at the time. Yeah, it's a very can good I just question. ask, oh, sorry, sorry, before Ben answers that question, can I just ask you, how good was it? Because everyone we spoke, no one is, that we spoke to tonight <laughs> told us they went there. What was it like? Uh, hey, I'm supposed to be interviewing you guys. Uh, <laughs> just you quickly. know, I, it, I guess I could talk about it a lot. The, the big thing is that you know, we're used now to having a concert with big screens and, you know, great sound. And we were about halfway back in the field and, you know, Elton John is, you know, an inch big and the sound mostly sounds like Charlie Brown's mom. Uh, but I mean, right. it, it was great. I mean, everyone was super excited and they were screaming for three hours and I mean, it was a great experience, but as just a concert experience. Yeah. I don't know, but, Definitely worth. Oh, I kind of like hearing that because it means means we could do something. Now we've got all the cameras and the sound. Um, Maybe we could do something to the people that were there. They can uh, we can move them. <laughs> I think. Um, I think it's amazing how when you go to his gigs today, you actually see so many young people that really that sort of really surprised me. You know, I remember on the show that I went to see, there was like seven and eight year olds in the front row who knew literally every line of every song. And so I think the crazy thing about Elton, unlike so many performers, is that he is somebody who has been as popular with each generation that he's performed to, whether it be my grandparents or my kids. They all know Elton John songs. And so I think that it's, you know, when a performer who's as cross generational as he is comes to an end and says, you know what, I'm not going to tour anymore. And this is it. This is the last time you can come and see me in America. I think it becomes a really amazing opportunity for people like Gabe and I and our team to produce that and reflect that and show that on Disney. And so um, so we're incredibly excited about it. One of the things that we're going to do in literal answer to your question is we're going to actually do a 20 minute show before Elton comes on, which will also be streamed on the same uh, Disney Plus platform. Um, and I think that we hope will uh, go some way to explain the significance of Dodger Stadium, why Dodger Stadium um, show the 1975 gig, but also pay homage to the career that Elton's had and explain to the audience that this is it. This is the last time he's going to be touring in America. And whether that be through little like sort of documentary style little bits or fans that we're interviewing who were there like you at the 1975 gig and are there in 2022 and also messages from everybody from the present United States to David Beckham and Billie Eilish all sort of saying what an amazing career Elton's had and wishing him luck for the night. So we're going to do everything we can to push the narrative to make the night feel as special and you don't want to miss it as possible because it truly is a uh, a crazy, you know, event to be covering. You know, oh, go ahead, Gabe, sorry. No, I was about to say, I think a lot of the work of, of how significant Elton is or has been has already been done in so much of popular culture, like, we were talking before about, you know, the Sing movies and how I'm Still Standing, you know, Taron Egerton doing I'm Still Standing in that film, then going on and playing Elton in Elton's movie. But I think a lot of the younger generation have, you know, I, I always, there, there's certain artists where you don't even know when you first listen to them. They're just every, but the music just seeps into you. You don't even know how you know the music that's there. And not with my kids, certainly, they know Elton. They don't, it's not been a conscious thing to sit down and go, this is Elton John. They just know him. They know his songs and he's such an icon and, and, and he's sort of been involved in so many significant aspects of culture from, you know, from the light. My kids watch The Lion King, so they know about Elton. They watch Sing, they know about Elton. They've got the books, you know, the kind of iconic figures books and there's an Elton one. So he's just, he's sort of everywhere without even trying. And I think that people understand how significant he is, you know, um, as a performer. So I think a lot of that work's done. That doesn't mean that we're not going to be building on that. And as Ben said, we've got 20 minutes where we lead you into the, to the show that tries to do that. But, you know, it's one of those things when you sit down to try and tell people who Elton is, like, how long have you got? You know, 20 minutes is only so much you can get through. <laughs> you know, you need a good couple of hours for that. Um, but I think it's out there. I think people know him. 
Well, I, I guess and either one of you could tackle this question, the, sort of the flip side of the idea that he's out there and everyone knows him is he's been doing it a long time. He obviously has a sense of who he is, how he should be presented, how he'd like to be presented. When you're dealing with that from a production side, you guys have dealt with big stars before, but what's sort of the process of going to someone saying, you know what, this is really something you should think about highlighting or think something you should be doing and, and sort of talking them into something which would be best for them anyway. Well, Ben is the best in the world at that. We haven't had to do that on this uh, on this particular job, but but my partner Ben is the absolute best at that. I've always said because we grew up together. Ben's got the ability to persuade anyone to do anything, and always always in the best intentions, but he can get anyone to do anything um, because he believes in stuff so wholeheartedly, and he can sell anything to anyone. So I have the best partner in the world for that. But on this particular job, we haven't had to. We've been really lucky that we've worked with the brilliant David Furnish. Um, and David really has a real vision. He had a vision for the tour, which he worked with Elton on, and he's had a vision for doing the movie, which he's doing with RJ. And he's got a vision for the live stream, which he's been, you know, um, he's been, you know, we've been lucky enough for him to share with us. So on this particular job, we've not had to do to really persuade anyone what we think is good for their career or what we think is a good move or, or, or a good show. But if we did, we got the best, we got the best there is. He sat right next to me. <laughs> well, well, certainly when you're doing a project like this, there's a lot of variables you're planning for worst case scenarios. What's something where you just think, you know what, we've got this planned out if it happens, but man, I hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> Go on, Ben. When you say, hold on, I'm, I'm just, Rick, I want to clarify the question. When you're saying you've got it planned out and then it doesn't happen, what do you do? As in, how do you fix that? What, and it can be a technical aspect. It could be, you know, one of the guests gets sick at the last minute. I mean, something where you're when you're going through your list of worst case scenarios, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? One of those things where you just think, you know, we can deal with this. But, man, please don't happen. <laughs> as long as we don't lose Elton. Yeah, I think so. As long as as long as listen, it's all, listen, I never like to think like that, Rick. I always plan for every occasion, but I never would talk out loud about it because you tempt fate. I'm too superstitious for all of that. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, look, I think this is, it's all, whenever you do anything live, there is always that element of nervousness because of course anything can happen. But I think we're in this, I think as soon as we go live and as soon as the stream starts and as soon as Elton walks and sings his first note, I think we'll sort of breathe a sigh of relief because although we have to film it in an amazing way and cut it and do it exactly right, I'll feel like um, I'll feel like it's we've got it there, and Elton, we're in safe hands because we're now in Elton's hands, and we'll think... just enjoy filming what will be an iconic concert. Rick, a, a funny story. We once pitched an idea actually to Disney, which was a Muppet special where it starts with Elton on stage, and they think it's a really good idea to fire him up in a rocket at the end of the song, and Elton <laughs> disappears out of the rocket, and they have to put a whole show on without Elton. And we actually wrote it beat by beat. And uh, that's been in my head the whole time. Like, we don't have the Muppets. How are we going to get through the show? Um, <laughs> that that's, I, I'd love to see that. That sounds like an that, amazing. <laughs> it was a great idea. Maybe one day. <laughs> you know, you guys have both worked with, you know, Paul McCartney now, Elton John, all these different people, all these different award shows. You know, is there some more you just think, you know, this is someone, maybe they're not the biggest star in the world, but this is someone we'd really like to tell their story. We'd like to do a special to highlight them because they deserve it. Um, I have an answer that you will you will know nothing about, but I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> but the most starstruck I've ever been was with a football player called Cyril Regis when he came to my house with a documentary I wanted to tell about, <laughs> a footballer called Laurie Cunningham. But I honestly can tell you that we've worked with everyone from Paul McCartney to... Harry Styles, and obviously now we're, we're honoured to be working with Elton, but sort of uh, 90s soccer players that were like icons when I was growing up, and actually when Elton um, was the owner of Watford, um, those those are the people that kind of reduced me into a kind of a bit of a mess. Um, but in terms of music, there's so many brilliant artists that we that we love working with, would love to work with. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm... I mean, there's, you know, we had an amazing, we had an amazing experience with Paul McCartney. Um, I would love to do something on Guns N' Roses um, because they were, when I was a teenager, that was 
you know, that was my that was my jam. And Kiss, Ben, do you remember how obsessed they used to be with Kiss? Obsessed with Kiss. You always used to like dress up as Kisses when we were kids. But, you, so were, you were obsessed with yeah, Kiss. So so there's, there's lots of artists like that, but there's no one bigger than Elton. I mean, well, I feel like we're at the top of the tree right now. There's nowhere to go. <laughs> well, I, I'm looking forward to this, and and I appreciate you guys taking the time to do this. I, I, uh, looking forward to just sitting back and watching. I'm sure you'll be happy to to when it's all over. So, <laughs> <laughs> take care, guys. Thanks, Thanks man. Yeah, thanks, mate. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you.